Hello, welcome to Cross Currents, produced by the City of Fort Collins in cooperation with the Larimer County League of Women Voters. I'm Barbara Rutstein, the moderator for today's program. Our topic is East Side, West Side Neighborhood Character Study, Bungalows versus McMansions. The older neighborhoods east and west of downtown Fort Collins are very popular areas in which to live. Proximity to downtown and walkability, neighborliness, mature landscape, diversity of homes and people are all qualities that residents and prospective residents value. The largest number of homes was built in two phases. The first phase was between 1901 and 1920. The second phase was between 1941 and 1960. So you can see, as lifestyles and owners change, pressure to remodel and redevelop accelerates. Many projects are welcome to the neighborhood, but some scrape-offs and larger projects elicit concerns that these projects will change the character and compatibility of the neighborhoods. In 1996, because of neighborhood concerns, the city adopted the voluntary design guidelines to help with redevelopment issues. These guidelines are now considered outdated. Starting in early 2011, the city began a study and public outreach process with the east side and west side neighborhoods to try to reach solutions to the renovation and redevelopment impacts. To discuss the possible changes to the redevelopment strategy are Pete Ray from Advanced Planning with the City of Fort Collins. He is here to help us understand the technical points and provide accur accuracy in the discussion. The other panelists have different points of view based on their experiences as a homeowner, builder, and remodeler. Next to Pete is Kevin Murray of Empire Carpentry, and he is a homeowner in the area. Next to him is Steve Whithall, a local builder by Design Homes and also owns property in the area. Next to Steve is Gina Jeanette, a homeowner in the area. Welcome to our studio audience and to our viewing audience. Let's start with uh, Pete. Give us a summary about the important points of the study. Okay, thanks Barbara. Um, before I, I get to that summary, I just want to briefly mention that you know the conversation about compatibility in the east side and west side neighborhoods and um, issues associated with the impacts of large uh, new construction or additions has been going on for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and there was um, the previous study that was uh, initiated in 2010, um, and it led to recommendations in the early part of 2011 um, for some potential uh, code changes that were initially um, adopted by City Council. They were later uh, repealed because of a citizen's initiative that was organized. Um, so later that year, Council directed staff to um, continue the discussion, but have a new look, a, a more broader look at um, a neighborhood compatibility and context. Um, there was a council ad, ad hoc committee that was established to um, uh, identify an initial goal for this new study, and that was to look at um, preserving and protecting the unique character and context of the neighborhoods as they continue to change with renovations, additions, and new construction. Um, it was also to address some of the key issues that, again, have been part of that discussion for many years associated with the impacts of uh, larger homes uh, on um, adjoining neighborhoods or within the context of, of the blocks within the neighborhoods. Um, we um, continued the public process through 2012, and we um, obtained um, really good uh, public feedback on um, identifying the the problem of the issues, those key issues associated with uh, large construction. Um, but of those that responded that there was a concern or issues, um, the public feedback concluded that uh, the problem was limited to only certain size projects and only within certain uh, areas or um, thresholds within the neighborhood. So that was really important. And any kind of in potential implementation 
um, strategy that was identified um, really should be catered to um, uh, limited applications based on that initial public feedback. This new study, um, we were uh, aided by a consultant team of Winter and Company that has um, been uh, has extensive experience throughout the country and and working with neighbors communities and dealing with compatibility and, and context issues. Um, and the study um, led to um, some key recommendations this fall that were presented to a council, a council work session on November 27th. Um, there was five um, strategies that were recommended to bring forward for implementation. And that included um, the um, promotion of the city's existing design assistance program mm -hmm. to create uh, greater awareness of, of that existing program. Um, to look at expanding notice for variance requests. It also included um, creating uh, new voluntary uh, design guidelines um, within the neighborhoods and also looking at um, some adjustments for measurement methods for uh, building sidewall heights uh, and large volume spaces um, uh, within uh, structures um, and also looking at uh, mass and scale um, uh, options for um, addressing floor air ratio uh, and solar impacts um, and that also includes looking at some potential new design standards for uh, building articulation um, height setbacks and things like that okay would any of our panelists like to add anything to what Pete has said D did any of you work with the 1996 guidelines and have problems with it Gina? Um, I was on city council from 1993 to 97, and this issue came up then, um, and it was very controversial then. And I, I think if you look at the big picture, um, it's come up when housing uh, becomes more in demand. That was after the, uh, what was it, the 89 to 91 recession, and then our, our housing and our growth population just grew really fast and um, it came up then and the city council struggled with it we tried some zoning changes and some other things um, it was very controversial citizens were at loggerheads so they the historic folks had presented lots of design guidelines and and when i say that those are architectural features windows doors front porches uh, things like that pitch roof pitches and uh, they were adopted as uh, voluntary. I think looking back, a lot of those things have really taken care of themselves because a lot of the new buildings are building in a historic-like style. Um, but what has not been taken care of is the, again, the big scale and mass and height kinds of issues. And that's really the, what's very controversial right now. Okay, what about the builders? Do you have any things to add to that? Well, I think that, um, you know, if you sort of wind back even a little bit farther, if we, if we go back to like the 90, in 1992, when we, when we had the alley house um, issue mm -hmm. and, the, and the, that massing and we had a building moratorium, we've, we've talked about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that we've, we have um, standards that are in place. Um, we have a system that I think currently is in place that primarily works. I mean, as I drove around Fort Collins, as I do every day, I, I'm amazed at, for example, if you go from City Park to Riverside on Magnolia, how, how little change has occurred in the 30 years that I've lived in Old Town. Um, conversely, if you look at some of your south areas that are new subdivisions, there's vast, huge change. Um, so I think in many ways, um, 30, 25 years ago, we, um, I had my choice of any place that I wanted to live. There were foreclosures all over Old Town Fort Collins. People constantly would say, well, why would you want to live there? Um, I think that, that as Fort Col Old Town has become a desirable place, I think that what the challenge is is how do we, um, how are we compatible? And is compatibility, what is compatibility? That's an important thing. Secondly, it's a balance between building a structure that, that, that maybe a 
pleasing to you or or others, but also meets the needs of um, the homeowner, the 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 the, the landowner, if you will. Um, I think that. Um, in 2010, when we embarked on the most current east side, west side, um, we focused a lot on the floor area ratio. Um, I think that city council hastily passed that. Um, I think that 2,500 registered voters in Fort Collins signed a petition that said, whoa, whoa, wait a second, not, we don't want this. Um, and I think that what we had was we have, a, we have unfortunately, we don't have a, a political um, representative here, but I think that this becomes a political issue as well because um, we're now revisiting a lot of the same things that people during the petition drive said that they did not want, and now we're adding more. And the floor area ratio that's that's uh, presented itself has just presented itself in the last two weeks, so it it's hard to start to digest that on such short notice. Okay, let's let's define what that is. Let's. Pete, define it, and then the rest of you can jump in. Well, the floor area ratio is part of the zoning um, standards and requirements within the neighborhood conservation low density uh, zoning district and the neighborhood conservation medium density uh, zoning district. And uh, those two zoning districts are um, distributed, again, in the east side neighborhood and the west side neighborhood. Um, uh, there is uh, a larger uh, area of the uh, neighborhood conservation medium density um, in both neighborhoods um, and the requirements for the, the floor area <coughs> ratio uh, within the east side neighborhood um, the, the neighborhood conservation low density is um, uh, set at uh, 0.4 which is 40% uh, lot coverage of 40% lot coverage yeah. is that what that means. And okay. the neighborhood conservation medium density is 0.5 or 50 percent. Okay, and what, what about the, the second floor? For the total floor area ratio. So, so. that includes first and second mm -hmm. floor. Yes. Right. Okay. And garage. And garage. And garage. And garage. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the existing, uh, those uh, zoning uh, districts were um, established in the early 80s. Uh -huh. And um, we haven't really seen historically very many um, project examples where the floor area ratio uh, comes close to the neighborhood conservation low density total floor area ratio or within the medium density of 0.5 or 50% coverage. There's been a few. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the pr prevailing um, character in the neighborhoods is um, below 30 percent. Okay, you had a comment. The established yeah. character. Yeah. If I might, I actually had to kind of go back to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, okay. I'm thinking that where I come from is, uh, you know, having been in uh, Old Town, well, since the 70s, I guess, off and on, but, uh, you know, all the time since the 80s. Um, it's more community. Uh, the uh, and the effect, I think we always see all these questions come up when someone does something different in a community and, it, and the community is, uh, feels blindsided almost and that's when all these uh, questions come up. Uh, Floreo ratio actually um, was one way to deal with uh, trying to minimize the shock value on the neighbors. Uh, Dana McBride actually brought this up back in 2008, I believe. And uh, it was his idea that a lot of people are cheating uh, their floor area ratio by making the building taller or uh, actually building up their property. And part of that, uh, for years, the, the city inspectors would make sure you didn't drain into your neighbor's yard. But then with the floodplain, people were starting to build up to get out of the floodplain and it affected their neighbors. So there, there's a been you know problems with that, but the idea is the floor area ratio. Uh, uh, that's actually I'm sorry. That's that's the uh, uh, the height with on your neighbors. But the floor area ratio, people were actually able to almost put three stories in, where some people did put a uh, area that would later be turned into a third story or more square footage after the inspection was done. Uh, so it was it, there was trying to kind of uh, keep the honest people honest that they that they put in the the ratio. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Gina. Yes. Um, 
I went back and did some research. Um, our neighborhood, I live on the west side, and uh, we're part of something called the Loomis Edition, and it's um, a section of Fort Collins that was annexed in 1887. So we're probably the heart of the old, oldest part of the town, or very close to that. And um, our neighbors and I have been researching our neighborhood to learn about the history of the houses and the, and, and the neighborhood. And um, one of the things that I found was in our neighborhood, which is from LaPorte Avenue to Mulberry and Whitcomb to Washington. So it's just west, a few blocks west, it starts of college. So it's that older neighborhood. Um, in that neighborhood, we had we currently have, this is from the assessor's files, uh, over 400 houses. And of those 400 houses, um, about 56% were built be between 1885 and 1910. So we have a lot of historic homes. These are the, the heart of the history of Fort Collins, where mm -hmm. the founding fathers and mothers came from and where lots of historical events came happened. And people have come to Old Town, I believe, and the value of Old Town has to do largely, not entirely, but largely with the historic character of the neighborhoods. They like that. So I looked at also, so of all these houses, it was real interesting to see when they were built, 84% um, uh, of all of them were built before 1940. And, and uh, in the course of the study by the consultants, they talked about in the different parts of these two big neighborhoods, um, what percentage of the houses are single story that were originally built as single story or a uh, story and a half, I think they mentioned that. Yeah. And I don't have those numbers in front of me, but there's predominant neighborhoods with nothing but s single story houses. So um, we have old houses, and, and then I looked at remodels in our neighborhood, and it is changing, and it is changing rapidly. So in our neighborhood, in, in these 400 houses, um, 194 have been taken out building permits for remodeling. That's, we're going off the assessor's files. And, and I just looked, before 1980, there were only 12 remodels. Uh -huh. uh, then the 80 to 89, it was 20, 90 to 99, 1999, 53, 2000 to 2009, 109. So you can see there is major change going on in our neighborhoods. I, right, and but that's, that's not, not bad all on the outside. And, and one of my points is that's yeah. not bad. A lot of the, the um, remodels and changes we all like. And you can drive down the street and not realize where they've been. The whole point of this exercise is about how much flexibility builder, builders have going forward. Mm -hmm. And it's to regulate the outliers, the people that come in and build a humongous house from lot line to lot line that is very high, that shades their neighbor's backyard, uh, affects their gardens, and it looks very incompatible with the neighborhood. So we're not talking about the vast majority of changes that have happened. We're pretty much all fighting about a small number. But the last thing I want to mention is what is at risk going forward and why don't we get to that in a little while okay well Just then you, i got some data on that okay so <laughs> okay ask me for that yeah well the the main thing is then with the far standards right or the the floor area standards how is it possible that they can build a building that takes up that much space it, it's only what 0 0.30 or 0 0.40 over the lot is it a tiny lot it I think that, that there's a few kind of misconceptions here or to rewind <clears throat> to what Pete said. One, one is it seems like what we want to do and what, what council is determined to do and a handful of residents, I think a vocal minority of the residents in Fort Collins and Old Town, um, basically want, want to set floor area ratio standards that, that right now are not shown to be problematic they, they haven't shown to be problematic the zero lot line that you talk about uh, is a myth um, the reality of it is is that we have setback requirements in the city of Fort Collins five on the side um, 15, 15 on the front five on the back if you back to an alley 15 if you don't back to an alley you have eve, eve height requirements um, you have a number of requirements the what we talk about and I think one of the the misconceptions uh, of of trying to create a policy, 
trying to create a problem and then fix it with a policy or fix it with a rule is that it impacts all people. Uh, nearly a, a number of remodels that I work on in Old Town Fort Collins, nearly all new constructions that I work on in Fort Collins are, are rigorous in trying to meet those requirements. They're difficult to be able to meet as it is. And when we start looking at making these systemic changes, I think that that what we do is it's a house of cards. I think that this overview, um, you know, this overview of the, the floor area ratio that we've talked about, like I said, it just arrived. That's exactly what occurred in, in 2012. It arrived and, and all of a sudden we, we, we scrambled to try to figure out what it meant. I think that is bad public policy. I think that you identify what a problem is and then you come up with a solution to that problem. And I think that what I see occurring is there's an, there are always egregious examples of bad building there and bad design. There are always those. You, we all see those. But that is not a pre predominant overview of new construction in Old Town Fort Collins. Okay, Pete had a comment. Right, and, and, and I agree with you. I think, you know, and through this process, it's been um, clear that the problem is limited. Uh, and there's, there's only, uh, it's a short list of um, excessive large construction that seems incompatible, um, mm -hmm. that has the looming effect, mm -hmm. impacts on privacy mm -hmm. and solar um, in context to the block uh, or the immediate adjacent homes. Um, when we're talking about floor area ratio, it, there's a lot that plays into this, and it's kind of interesting that if it is, it's just one tool of many that can be used to address compatibility. And in 2010 and 11, the focus was really on um, the aspects of large house size. And the, the main tool that was brought forward was a slight reduction in floor area ratio. And if you look at that tool just by itself, and you really want to have an impact on reducing the overall size of, of, of large homes, you would have to re significantly reduce the existing floor area ratio in the NCL and the NCM zoning districts to really have an impact. Because what we mentioned earlier is the prevailing development pattern in these two zoning districts is for the, for the low, de low density um, conservation, it's about um, 0.25. So that's, and for that's the, taking up 20% <coughs> or 25% of the lot. Right. And okay. for the medium density, the prevailing um, FAR is under three. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. again, if you just looked at that tool by itself, you would, if you really wanted to have a significant impact, mm -hmm. you would have to push the existing FAR Way down. down below that, exi that existing um, development um, pattern. In 2010, again, the, the, the formula for calculating the adjusted FAR was a slight reduction. Mm -hmm. They also looked at a couple of measurement methods, but, and that was uh, approved by council and later repealed. Um, what we're looking at um, with the re recommendations of, of this continued study is a, a package and combination of um, strategies to address the issues of those um, case studies and, and again, short list of, of the recognized overly large construction examples. And do um, they, the overly large ones, I think there are a couple of, I don't know if they're duplexes or fourplexes on Wood Street that I noticed. Right. That well, I can't believe that they only take up 40% the, of the they, lot. They we don't. were, uh, the focus of our um, study was looking at the impacts of single-family residential. Okay. In the, in the medium density zoning district, it does allow duplexes and fourplexes. Um, there already is existing um, compatibility standards in the land use code that address the impacts of, of multifamily. But that's supposed projects. to be 50%, right? Right. And so when you look at some of those, I mean, there aren't many, two or three, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like there's 50% green space unless it's hidden somewhere behind the <laughs> garages or in the middle. I don't know about that, but that's just the way it looked to me. And I, right. you know, I didn't do a study of it. I, I drove around a little bit. Yes, Kevin. Well, um, I think those are probably one of the unique ones like, like uh, Steve was talking about. I do want to disagree with Steve thinking that it's a vocal minority that seems to be coming back and back and, and uh, being at all these meetings. Uh, 
and I, because uh, well, maybe I'm a vocal minority, I don't know. But um, the, uh, I also see that the original FARs were down at about 0 .30 for the areas we're talking about now, but zoning kept getting so many requests to expend over that they asked to have the FARs uh, raised. And uh, they're, I'm, I'm sure they're having a hard time talking about having these lowered again. Uh, the one thing that isn't mentioned that happened in 2010 in the original east side, west side, was that um, we also looked at maybe the FARs could stay the same, but what we wanted to do was not have the Queen Mary land in the middle of a bunch of yachts. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to grow slowly, and we had a formula, I think uh, Pete mentioned it, uh, that, but the formula made it so that you took a ratio of the houses around you and you could grow a certain amount above that. And that was thrown out, but the idea that the whole neighborhood could grow up to that, that uh, 0.5, but you just couldn't do it overnight and cause such a much, uh, so much disruption to your neighborhood. Okay, I think there's a question in the audience. Would you give us our na your name and then direct your question to one person and then I'll let everybody answer? Or you don't have to. If you want them all to answer, that's okay, too. My name is Nancy York, and actually, could I just add one thing about the far and but my question really is about uh, solar access um, one of the th one of the ways to uh, to get around the the limitation of the of the of the far mm -hmm. well floor area floor area, floor area <laughs> ratio is to run a a balcony off that it doesn't have sides so you have this big balcony that sits over the backyard and uh, doesn't count for for the any mm -hmm. ratio in mm -hmm. but my real real interest is is about the solar access and i i know that this current uh proposal is is about uh measuring solar access at spring equinox and i i'm wondering if it would not be better to have it at winter solstice because we all know the importance of light and sunshine to, in our lives and, and as for the energy value. So I would very much uh, like to hear your comments about, about spring equinox versus winter solstice. Mm. Okay. Well, <laughs> What's well, the I rationale? Like, well, I like both of them. <laughs> um, I, I think that, I think that th this is a really legitimate argument and, and, and conversation to have. But at the same time, I think that um, it's a very slippery slope. And I think that if we use the, the, um, the picture that, that we're looking at currently, um, really, if you, oh, yes. if, if you would, if, if, if you, one is, there's some really interesting things about this photograph. One is the living space cantilevers over to create a covered front porch, which you all look and say, well, that's really appealing. The reality of it is, is that that's not to occur with current building standards. It's supposed to be basement wall, first floor wall, second floor wall, no cantilever of living space over. So that, that, that's kind of problematic in that it's probably just slipped through the cracks. Um, I think that one of the things that, that I believe is as far as building height, as far as um, solar access or, so, or solar blockage, if you will, we, we have to understand a little bit more about the history and what we have to work with. Um, in Old Town, predominantly, we have 35-foot lots. They're 35 by 160, 180. The reasoning behind that, if you look at it historically, and you touched on it briefly, was that it enabled people to build their house, their bungalow to the front of the property, to have a garden space, and to pull their horse-drawn carriage in. That's why, we have the, that's why we have these long and narrow lots. So as time changes and horses leave and cars come and people change the way that they live, that how we have to build and how, what, how we have to treat that changes as well. Now, when you start to look at that, some of the diagrams in this massing and you start looking at it, you run into an immediate problem because we all of a sudden go from ground, which is the ground, the Let's dirt, show if the, you will. Let's show the picture um, again. 
to the eave height. There so we, we have so we have the the dirt to the eave height all of a sudden is being proposed to being 18 feet instead of from where the house starts to where where the soffit is. The the problem with that is and the problem with these the diagrams that are built that makes the interior space of the house which is five, then 5 feet which, which is not habitable space and doesn't count for the FAR. And my, my point with these is that if we're spending the time and energy, we're spending a huge amount of money with Winter and Associates, city staff, and, and I think that it's been stated by us that really there's a, we want to solve the egregious problem. I think by putting this policy into effect, it doesn't solve the egregious problem but it creates unintended consequences. It creates other problems. I think that we have things that are in place right now. I think that, that the city is being, the, the city staff, as far as planning and zoning, is doing a much better job of doing the plan check and reviewing things and making sure things are above board. You can take these statistics all day long, but the reality of it is, is that in, in 1930, people didn't permit projects. In 2012, you can't do a pergola without it being permitted. So you, you really have to be careful with data. If, if you, you can use data inappropriately, and I think that in this particular case, it's, it is being used inappropriately. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Well, um, taking it back to solar, if, if you guys would put the picture back up there yes, again. Yes, we Sorry. could put the picture back up. And if you want to go over there and point something out, that's certainly well, acceptable. Uh, hopefully I'm going to be a very good describer because I really like this chair. <laughs> uh, we did the, uh, a study of this picture in the first east side, west side. Uh, when we did do the, um, the, the spring and uh, fall equinox, and uh, what you're seeing is, you know, a new house, a wonderful, actually a very nice design, I think, uh, right next to an existing house. And um, this is one of the narrow uh, lots like Steve was talking about. Uh, but the way the spring hit, if you, if you went off of that um, dormer to, you know, that's almost right over the property line, it would just barely cover that snow patch. You can, you can see the sun or the shade there on top of the roof by the tree. On the left side of? On the right side of the little, little house. The right side of the little house yeah, and the left side of the new house. Pretty much the, at, at, in the spring uh, solstice, that the, what's right of the tree on the little house is shaded. Uh, the winter uh, solstice, it shades everything but the la last couple of feet of the house. So that whole house would be shaded all day during, during the winter. And this picture was actually uh, uh, someone uh, pointed out, they said the person who was living in there was getting, uh, having a hard time living in it and since the house was built next door and they were moving out because they couldn't handle being in the dark all winter long. So it's a good point that maybe the, we need to look at, at uh, I think it's a step forward that we're going with the spring equinox because we had nothing really except for solar, uh, guaranteeing solar access for existing active and passive systems from the 70s. I'm not sure if it's still on the books or not. But um, this, you know, giving everybody a livability, too, uh, it's helpful. But, yeah, maybe we should be looking at winter also uh, or moving forward in the winter because that's when people need the sun more in their lives. We've all heard of uh, SAD. I forget what that stands for, but that sort of thing. Uh, speaking to uh, also Steve's comments, my whole neighborhood is 50 and 60 by 180 and, and 150 lots. 190. I think mine's 60 by 190, so they're wider, and you can back off. And I've worked with my neighbor when he put his addition on, uh, trying to, to so that he said his people set their houses back a little bit. You don't have to build all the way up to the front, uh, so that you can actually still get the solar access for the people next door. And you, so you kind of move. You, there's things to do to make it work. I'm glad to see that it was worked on this time. It wasn't dealt with in the first one very well. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that, that the solar access thing. Is, is anyone here really familiar with this construction, this house that we, we were seeing? Uh, yes. Now, why is it up higher than the other house? That's my question. Maybe, Ann, if you could put that on again. It looks like it's built up. The, that, that's one of the really big challenges in Old Town, um, and especially in this east side, west side area, because we have approximately 
um, 600 houses that are impacted by the floodplain. Um, this is not one of those houses. Um, w one of the challenges when, w when we build is a finished floor, uh, the height of finished floor. Um, and w we're required to do a great, we're re it, and it, it's ever expanding. In the beginning, it used, it used to be a site plan with flow arrows the, uh, that I as a builder used to be able to create. Now we have, now, now we solicit the help of um, engineers to do elevations and, and basically we're required to have our lot drainage flow to the public way. And that is really a challenge um, in Old Town. And, and this is a really good, pretty good example of this because th this house that's to the north of it is, uh, is almost a flat from sidewalk to threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when you try to apply that um, with, by lowering that house, it, it becomes really problematic to be able to meet the grading certification that's required by the city. So if, and I think that there's a number of examples of that. I, I'm working on a project on, on Whitcomb Street that's a, a block away from yours and, and um, where, where your neighborhood is and mm -hmm. yours, Nancy. And, and, and I would have much preferred to nestle that on the curb. I think that it would have been much more appealing. It would have been much more, um, it would have been much less impacting. But the city dictated, the city dictated what my finished floor elevation, and it was four feet above the sidewalk. So the thing is, is that if we're gonna, if we're gonna create a mound of dirt, and then we're gonna build 18 feet on top of that mound of dirt, that is really problematic. It's not only bad design, it's aesthetically not very pleasing. Um, luckily, I, I, I have clients that are really trying to work with landscaping and doing some things to moderate that look. But I think that, I think that there are so many dovetails to the grading certification, the storm drainage, the finished floor elevations, what can be out of the ground, what, how high an eave height can be, that all of a sudden what you start to end up with is you start to end up with a, 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 an embellished box, if you will. Um, and then anything that varies from that embellished box is maybe not appealing to you or might not be appealing to, to, to others. But one of the things that oftentimes comes up when I do uh, a variance or when I do a review is the, the kind of the meat and potatoes of, the, of what it's going to impact. But by the time the project's done, if you go, for example, to Grant and Maple Street where I built six homes there, the objection isn't size, the objection isn't height, the objection is color. And I think that it's really interesting. These are all really subjective things. And, and I believe in a diverse community. And I believe that, 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 that by adding these things as policy, it limits that. Okay, now my question then is, if, if this house that we were looking at had to be built up for city uh, specifications, what happens to the others in the area? <laughs> that, that is a real problem, because I think that it actually puts the building department and storm stormwater kind of in uh, having problems because stormwater, well, they don't want you to build up too far, but they want you to to if you don't uh, get get out of the floodplain, then you have to end up um, uh, you know you can't put a basement in. You'll have to have uh, blowout uh, areas for your foundation to let water flow through, and. Uh, at the same time, the inspectors are looking to make sure you're not going to flood the neighbors. And so the house we had up here uh, does affect the neighbors, and th the inspectors have to kind of go with, uh, are you trying to make it work? And, uh, if, and I suppose if the neighbor ever complains, they'll have to put in some type of a drain tile system. What it, well, it strikes me that I don't know with that street particularly, but let's say there are five houses or ten houses on that street. You could have some up and some down, mm -hmm. and then it... It, well, it, you it have a whole like bunch that are very homogenous in terms of height, and then you have a big tall one. And I don't know for sure, but I believe that. Do you consider that a, a story and a half, or do you consider that a full two story? Uh, um, well, I don't know if and the. Because I don't think that's as tall as it could be. Yes, I and I don't sure. know I, that I that's. That um, because there's much taller ones, and so that's. You're getting into the solar, but you're getting into the pallet. They stick out, and, you know, one of the. Well, they stick out, but I don't. 
it, looking at that house from here, it doesn't look that large. It's just that it's been built it, up, and then you have the up and down, and until you redevelop the whole street, maybe you you, you have a problem. I believe that this gets to really the crux of the problem, it, and 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 yet and yet it's barely touched in this, and that is why can we why. Why do, we, why do we have to have these finished floor elevations that are so high and out of the ground? You, you never, as a builder in Fort Collins, you're, you're never reprimanded if you build it too high. But, but you'll, you'll be, you, you will be reprimanded and you'll have a hard time getting a CO if you build too low. And what, what ends up happening, um, especially where they're um, in a number of areas where there are abandoned alleys, um, where 10 houses are along the peripheral edges of a construction site that we work on will, will be in a hole. They'll, they'll drain kind of in and to themselves. And then I go to build a house or go to do a substantive remodel, and all of a sudden then I'm to, be a, I'm, I'm to make sure that all of my water flows to the public way. And all, the only way of having that occur it oftentimes is the, these retaining walls. So they, we almost just build this retaining wall so that we can get things high enough to be able to drain out. It's not compatible, it's not practical, it, 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 it defies any kind of common sense. And I think that argument, this, this argument, looking at new construction and, and, and really asking questions about, let's look at that piece, because that would really help us to lower the solar impact because it would lower the threshold, it would lower the finished floor. We, we're not talking about doing raised ranches, you know, here. We're, you know, that's a, that's a common um, design feature of a 1920s house. What we are talking about is just trying to meet a minimum floor height requirement. And we, so we already start off with a problem. So, and that has to do with flood control, is it that right? To, it has to storm do with storm drainage. Storm, storm, storm rain drainage. coming down. But then, but then it also has to do with the floodplain, of which 600 homes are impacted, and a lot of those are in that, um, in the area of Whitcomb. You, you're, you're right on the, the fringe of the floodplain. Um, um, and, and what ends up happening with that is that they, they dictate where that 500-year flood occurs and then we're to be two feet above that. So in essence, um, my clients that will be living at 321 Whitcomb, when all of the houses around them float away, they will be two feet out of the water. And, and subsequently, it's, it's, it's very uncomfortable design for me being an aesthetic person. Um, and, and I wish that there would be some level of flexibility. There almost is no, no um, sort of working together with floodplain, storm drainage, they just will dictate this is going to be your finished floor. Okay, Gina. I'd like to respond to that. I was on the water board for eight years and I brought it up multiple times of why do we have these raised basement, base, you know, bottom walls and they said it was the planning department. So the two city departments <laughs> don't agree. But I think this whole discussion uh, the height of that first floor absolutely affects the height of the building, but I'm a I'm a bigger picture person, and I want I think we're getting kind of off on a tangent, mm -hmm. and I want to look at the bigger picture of change in this neighbor in these neighborhoods. Okay, wait a one minute. I think Pete had a comment, and then we'll get to your okay comments. Well, I just wanted to say, and, and back you know looking at this picture, obviously there's there's a, a high degree of contact contrast between the existing smaller bungalow on the north. Uh, and this two-story, I don't know if it's an addition or, or new, construction new construction with this project, but um, you know that meets the two the two-story height requirement. Um, Steve's right that um, there is circumstances and uh, examples out there where the finished floor is raised up because of floodplain requirements. There's also by choice, uh, whether it's the owner or the builder choosing to elevate um, the basement to get additional egress. Uh, and sunlight in the um, uh, in the basement. So we've seen examples of you know voluntary um, uh, raised grade and and a combination of requirements to do that. Um, 
so I just okay yeah. now Gina okay you're into compatibility uh, picture and wise and yes picture wise right um, I maintain I think Old Town's a wonderful place to live I think the values are rising uh, because of the nature of the place and the character that it has but one of the things that's that's different than most other parts of town is there are no homeowners associations and I maintain that in the neighborhoods in most of the new subdivisions and by new that could be you know 1960 or 1970 to the present um, there are homeowners associations architectural review committees and covenants that would not let any of this happen in in most of Fort Collins and because of that we're like a free fire zone and anything goes and there's these expectations that anything should go and I think the tension here is between people willing interested in doing economic redevelopment of our neighborhoods for their monetary gain and their profit which is affecting the quality of life of the people who live in the neighborhood and so we're like we're like a, a cornfield that somebody wants to develop well oh hey let's go to old town and start tearing down houses and build big stuff oh. and flip it for lots of money and what is at risk um, these are the numbers from the city um, for this large area that's in the study area there's 3371 3, dwelling units of those uh, 36 percent are a thousand square foot or below so to me that's 36 percent of the housing in these older neighborhoods that we like we like the diverse character both of the housing stock and of the people who live there the social diversity includes um, different ages different ethnicities different incomes um, you know we have the poor college student to the wealthy yuppies we have uh, retired people it's a very diverse neighborhood but I look at those 1200 houses that are under a thousand square feet as just uh, fodder for the economic development interests to come in and tear them down and and build something new the next category of houses a thousand to fifteen hundred square feet there's 40 percent of the houses there so 76 percent of these neighborhoods have low smaller housing that is both afford more affordable to a variety of people who it's uh, suitable for rentals it's suitable for uh, young couples with starter homes it it is way more than just how much money can I make flipping this lot and building a big house and for me that's what's at risk and do we yeah. know how much of that and if is we had an HOA, HOA probably none of this would be happening look. so we in, in the community have gone to our city council to ask for help to get rid of the most egregious problems and the largest incompatible houses but you, know, but you can't get rid of them because they're well, new ones right well, well, that's what yes. i'm saying and, 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 you know you, why you know, should when you listen to when you listen to, when you listen to her speak <laughs> it, it, one is um, one is you you get this impression that it's as she said it's just a free-for-all down here I, I would love to have people walk through the design the plan check the process it is not a free-for-all secondly it's like if you want to go to an HOA there are a number of places south of town that have those HOAs that would be probably more than welcome to to to, uh, to embrace you in that there are a lot of people that I believe in Old Town that value the diversity of living here. That that an 800 square foot bungalow is not compatible with the to meet the needs of a growing family. And 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 I believe that we I believe that we should embrace all different all, all different people, whether they be young families, whether they be retired. But this whole notion of the fact that by creating more regulation and more stipulation is going to make housing affordable, I don't know, I invite you to go to Boulder with me and work there. And I guarantee you that adding policy does not make things less expensive. And I have an example for you on this. I met with some clients recently that did a rem an, an addition um, in nine years ago. And they, they spent in design and, um, and building permit fees under $1,000 to do their 600 square foot addition on their house. 
and they wanted to do another addition on their house, a 300 square foot dish addition, far beyond the far. They wanted to attach a garage on that. And just to be able to get them to a position where they could actually build was right in the neighborhood of around $10,000. The average permitting cost for a new home in Fort Collins is 30, between thirty and thirty-five thousand dollars, and in Old Town, that oftentimes doesn't get you a sewer to your property line. It doesn't get you adequate electricity to do this. So the the thing is, is it's it's to think that you have to look at economics, but you have to look at reasonable economics when somebody comes in and knows that they're going to end up having to spend you know, 40,000, between 30 and $40,000 on permitting, then do the street cut to get sewer and water in. They're gonna be in, they're gonna be in this project a, a substantial amount of money. It's not practical to assume that they're going to build a thousand square foot bungalow. So I, I think this is where we have, this is why I love living in Fort Collins. That's why I love building here, is that this is, that, that we, sh it's, it's a big tent. We should all be able to have ideas, but we should start to work on, we should start to look at other things. If we want to preserve this really quaint nature of Old Town, then we, then we ought to take serious preserving things that are historical. And we ought to be able to incentivize those. I lived for years in an historically designated building on the corner of 400 Wedby. Mm -hmm. I paid $18,000 to permit that, to change the use from a church to a house, and I still had to redo all the sidewalks. And I went over today, because I'm working on a project, and the curb and gutter is completely falling apart and in disrepair. There's still overhead lines for telephone lines. I mean, we have bigger issues to, I believe in the city if we want to keep the quaint nature of this. Okay, so, let's, let's let Kevin say something and then we're near the end. Well, <laughs> Get I, your I, final comments in a few right. minutes. I'm thinking once again, uh, going back to Gina's uh, comment that keep the big picture in mind, um, I, I thought it was interesting that the first group was very technical and had uh, the, the east side, west side from 2010 uh, came up with very technical things to try to put into uh, an ordinance. And then in August, uh, Nora Winters' uh, group said, we're trying to keep, be different, we're trying to keep it more loose and all this, and it comes down to almost the exact same thing in a lot of ways. So um, there are vocal people that are looking for change. I don't see the, um, the floor area ratio making a big difference, and then I'm still seeing uh, in our neighborhood, if our, our houses are about 1,700 square foot uh, average, and it will allow about 3,500 square feet. So it'll be in the next house could be twice the size of every house in the neighborhood. That's the kind of stuff that people get upset about that needs to be looked at still. Um, and I think the historic part, we have a historic downtown. We need to look at keeping a certain amount of historic Fort Collins residential to connect it Two, otherwise we're going to be losing a lot of our, um, uh, the reason people come to Fort Collins. Okay, I, I, good. Right. Now, for your final comments, I would just like you to uh, tell us what you th hope would come out of this study. And we'll just go down, take about a minute each, and then we'll have our, I'll conclude. But what would you hope to come out of this study if you had your druthers? Well, actually, we had a, a workshop last week with the consultants that the public was invited to, and uh, I'm pretty happy with their, their recommendations, quite frankly. Um, I think they will, they have a change of way you measure the height, which will probably keep some of the houses from being so high and so overwhelmingly, uh, you know, they, they, you have this thing overlooking your house. You lose the privacy of your backyard and all kinds of things. So I, I'm largely encouraged by the recommendations. I think I will be supporting them. They've added solar access in there, and I, 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 solar access came up every time this, uh, the public spoke, that they were, there were problems with height and shading and solar access. So we need to do something about that. Um, okay, the, let's go on. One, one, one thing quick. on solar access is that uh, what they're proposing is moving the north boundary, the, uh, the, the, fr the wall on the north side of the lot, farther back. And I have uh, a concern that that will make for asymmetrical roofs, because you're not requiring a symmetrical building. You're just moving one side. 
And evidently Boulder has already tried that and they're trying to treat that because that's problematic. So I think they need to look into that. Okay, but that's it. I we support don't have enough the recommendations. Time. Okay. Next. Well, I, I'm glad to be able to be involved in a in a lively debate on this. I think that um, I think that Fort Collins is a great place to live. I think that, you know, as Darren Atterbury says, it's a world class city. I don't think that it got here by not having policies in place that solve the majority of the problems. I think that there are too many potential unintended consequences that could come out of changing what is currently in place. Okay, next. I see uh, the work that was done this last year as, as really important that we ought to get it passed this time and not, and not shot down by uh, 2,500 people uh, again. We, we need to have some, some type of standards because this keeps popping up. And, we need, and we, uh, once we get it down, the, we have to support it and keep it in there. Okay, Pete. All right. Well, I really appreciate this opportunity and I, I, I value this discussion. I think there's some really good points that have been brought up. As part of the study in 2012, um, based on public input and professional recommendations from our consultant team and staff, um, we forwarded to City Council at the work session on November 27th um, recommendations, uh, strategy recommendations to solve the, the goal and the issues that were identified in this process. Council gave us um, additional direction to proceed with uh, five strategy options. Mm -hmm. um, and that included um, um, promotion of the existing design assistance program I mentioned before, look at expanded notice for variance requests, look at measurement methods for building sidewall height and large volume spaces, um, look at um, floor area ratio, and also some additional design standards as part of this process, including solar access. Um, the floor area ratio discussion didn't just start on November 27th. Um, we've had, it's been ex extensively discussed in 2010 and 2011. It's been extensively discussed through this process, including solar, as Gina mentioned. Um, and so we're in the process of formulating implementation of those strategy options to bring forward and ultimately city it's city council's decision they will be considering um this implementation on february 19th okay so people who are interested in this can come to a city council meeting and hear the discussion and possibly give some comments this cross currents program will be rebroadcast at various times during the month on channel 14 Please consult your lo local listings for the exact dates and time. Copies of recent cross current programs are available for checkout at the three libraries, the Old Town, Council Tree, and Front Range Community College branches of the Poudre River Library District. The video is available at the League of Women Voters website, which is www.lwv Larimer County. Dot org. Thank you to our participants and thank you to our studio audiences and our viewing audience. <laughs>